Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. I'm happy that you can be here with us today to continue our study in the book of Acts. Uh, today we're in uh, the sixth and seventh chapter of Acts. It's really a pivotal moment in the history of the church. The church was growing rapidly, but there comes along something that could affect its growth negatively, ends up really affecting its growth positively. Elton Trueblood says, calls the early church an incendiary fellowship. F.F. F. Bruce calls it a, a spreading flame. This first century phenomenon had no constitution, no organizational plan, nothing but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to keep its cohesive and, and heading in the right direction. While the church remained relatively small, this worked just fine. Eventually, however, the Jerusalem church encountered the perils that accompany rapid growth. And what we see here is the rapid growth that occurs causes problems, really logistical problems uh, for, uh, for, for the early church. And we counter the, the story that most of you know already is the story of Stephen and the story of his sermon before the Sanhedrin. Before we even get to it, I'll tell you, it's the longest sermon uh, in the entire book of Acts. It's uh, uh, most of chapter seven. Chapter six sets it up. And the problem that we have in chapter six is that some of the Hellenistic Christians, Hellenistic Greek speaking Christians, believe their widows were being overlooked in the di daily distribution of food. Remember that the Christians had come together they put all of their wealth in common. And uh, so they were sharing food. They were sharing uh, financial support. And this created dissension, created tense situation among the members of the early church because the Greek speaking Christians were not getting, they felt like, what the Hebrew Christians we're getting are the Hebrew Jews. So let's look at this problem beginning in chapter six, verses one through four. It says in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Christians among them complained against the Hebraic Christ Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this relate responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, you notice they say the disciples are increasing. It simply means here that uh, that Luke is referring to the entire assembly. Uh, referring to them as disciples of Christ, not the specific group of the 12, but the whole group. And they were increasing. Remember what Gamaliel had said? He said, let this, let this group go along. And if it increases of num in number, it's of God. If it doesn't, then we'll know. But it was increasing. And the increasing in persecution uh, only led to increased commitments. And so uh, it, it appears that they were kind of untouched at this time. And so as a result, uh, large numbers of people came in and people from different backgrounds. Luke refers here to, to two or three different groups. There's the Hebraic Jews and then there are the Grecian Jews. Uh, sometimes you see uh, the Grecian or uh, Jews referred to as the Hellenists. That is that they followed Greek speaking customs of the Mediterranean world. Uh, and, and they were not going to the temple as often as those uh, people in Jerusalem were able to. Uh, they, 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 they did their worshiping uh, through their synagogues in their, own system, in their own cities. The Hebraic Jews were those people who lived in Palestine. They were the descendants of the exiled Jews who had returned from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah and Ezra. Uh, they were intensely nationalistic. Uh, they were vigilant in their observance of the law. And uh, these, uh, these uh, Hebraic Jews 
still thought of themselves as Jews and as Christians as well. The Hellenists were no less Jewish. They, they were no less Hebrew because they were descendants of Abraham, at least by birth and bloodline. But their practice was different. Uh, they, they adopted a lot of the customs of the Gentile neighbors that they had. Uh, many of the Hellenists, although they rejected pagan religions, worshiped God exclusively. They came to the temple uh, for sacrifices and festivals. They generally obeyed the law of Moses. Even so, they dressed like Gentiles. They socialized with Gentiles and they embraced the Roman government as their own. While the Hebrews scrupulously kept uh, th themselves insulated from the Gentiles, and, and, and continued to think of them as Jews, and they were very nationalistic. And so the ministry of the Word of God was interrupted by this. And so the leaders, the apostles, recognized the dangers of ignoring this rift. And so they decided, we'll come up with a way to solve the rift and to protect the unity of the church. And actually, it was a very compassionate response because they wanted the widows to be taken care of. Uh, and, and, and so uh, they understood that something needed to be done. But the 12 said, we need to, to reserve our preaching time so that we can preach, we can share the word of God. And so let's pick some people to do this. And so the, the scripture says, choose some people, choose seven people, seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and the wisdom and put them in charge of this. While the apostles use their spiritual gifts, these people would be serving and they would be uh, fulfilling the need that this congregation had. And so they looked for people who are full of the spirit and wisdom. Uh, it's, it's more than just somebody being competent, but somebody who is in tune with God. God's going to empower this individual to do what he wants them to accomplish. We have the same thing in, in our churches today. Now, today we call those people who are selected for this duty as deacons. These are the original deacons uh, of the church. Uh, many of us have more than seven deacons, but there are some churches who stick to seven, some smaller churches that I know of. Uh, but these people had to be solid in their reputation. They had to be filled with the Spirit. And so as the events that in Acts unfold, the readers see how these men, especially Stephen and Philip, were used by God to serve the people. In fact, uh, they were used in a powerful way. Choose these men, it said. The word that said here, the used here is known to be uh, full of the Spirit. This speaks of a reputation proven over time. It's not a fly-by-night person. This is a person that we know they're solid and, and, and they're going to, to do the things the church needs to do. This did, they, they did more, this original group did more than wait on tables, as we shall see. Uh, but the apostles seemed to think that it was very important for them to look after this handful of widows so there was not dissension uh, within the church. And you recall they had put all of their money together, all of their uh, worldly possessions together so that they could take care of everyone in the church. Now, one thing that, that we need to make sure we understand, they weren't just choosing people to be servants, to pee other people. They were choosing people to be servants of God. And one of the things that, that, that they were to be picked for was their relationship, a demonstration of their, uh, of their uh, service to God. The power of Christian service is the power that comes from being clothed in God's Holy Spirit. If you have that power, no, no matter how menial the task, you know, they didn't say we're calling these people to be great preachers. We're calling them to be great theologians. There, there's nothing more special than a person who's empowered by the Holy Spirit to do even the most menial things in the church. And so it's important that, that the Holy Spirit gives this person the power to do it. And, and do you think 
Uh, do not think that your day's work and all its challenges will be the same category, all of those things that you do in that day. I recall just one brief example of a lady that my wife knew in our church when we were in Keller, Texas. And her responsibility as an employee of the church was to clean the rooms uh, of the preschool area. And she saw it as a calling from God. It was a, a responsibility that she undertook with the power of the Spirit in her body to do it every time, to get it ready for Sunday morning uh, for the children to come into. That's the same thing. We depend on God's guidance, whatever the task may be. We depend on God's guidance for things that, that might even seem trivial in life to some people. The, the pattern here is you're a Christian. You're, you're looking for God's guidance all the day long. No matter what you're doing, His guidance is important to you. That's what we're looking for here in these seven disciples, what they were looking for in, in these seven disciples. Uh, Alexander McLaren says, unless my Father in heaven can guide me about what we very mistakenly call trivial everyday things, His guidance is not worth much. And so even the small things of life look for God's guidance to do those things and, and depend on God to put you in the right direction, in the right spot. What an awesome thought. What an awesome thought that even the most trivial things that you do, God's guidance is there because you're looking for it. Uh, uh, William Barclay said, it is extremely interesting to note that the first office bearers to be appointed in the church were chosen not to speak, but for practical service for practical service. They, they weren't preachers, although some of them did become preachers, but they were chosen for practical service. No matter what you do in God's kingdom, let the Holy Spirit guide your work and it can bring fruit in the kingdom of God. Now look at verses five through seven. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, per Perminus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This person, Stephen, called a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Note here that the characteristic that made this man, Stephen, qualified for his job. It, it, not Stephen is smart. Stephen can speak. He was a man that was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. G. Campbell Morgan said this, one who is living a normal Christian life, fullness of the Spirit is not a state of spiritual aristocracy to which few can attain. Anything less than the fullness of the Spirit for the Christian is the disease of the spiritual life, a low ebb of vitality. Fullness of the Spirit is not abnormal, but normal Christian life. We should all be, be carrying the fullness of the Spirit with us. Uh, apparently the others fit the same description or they would not have been chosen. Uh, and if you look at the names that are there, they're all probably Hellenistic Jews because they have Greek names, which is okay. Uh, they, the, the, this church needed and wanted to be inclusive in, in everything. Notice in verse five that Luke mentioned Nicholas as a convert. He was a Jewish proselyte. He was a Gentile who had gone through all of the steps to become a part of the Jewish faith. He was not an ethnic Jew, but he was a convert into the Jewish faith. He, 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 he met all the description, though. He was full of the Holy Spirit. Two of the greatest New Testament saints also came to full maturity through this office. Stephen, who would be martyred, and we'll talk about him a lot in this lesson, and Philip, who would be a successful evangelist. This is the Philip 
who converted the Ethiopian eunuch. He's the Philip who became uh, the, the person that spread the gospel in several places in and around uh, the, the Holy Land. One commentator writes that without Stephen, there might not have been an Apostle Paul a break with Judaism, nor worldwide Christianity. Stephen is the personification of the transition Luke wants us to feel. So you've got Stephen here. And Stephen uh, is a martyr, but because of his martyrdom, many people feel that it had at one point an influence on Paul. Remember, Paul comes along in this story where he holds the cloaks while these people stone Stephen. Uh, uh, notice what the results of their action was. The word of God spread. It spread greater. It moved quicker. Uh, second, the number of disciples in Jerusalem was increased. Here's, uh, they're hoping that this place, this thing's just going to die of its own accord. It doesn't. Gamaliel was right. If it's of God, it'll spread. And it did. And then a large number of priests became obedient to, to the faith. Uh, th this would be a force in the church. And, and it's interesting to think about who were these priests? We don't have a whole lot of record of that, but it would be interesting to know who they were. And so as Christians, we must be willing to wait on tables. If the Sunday school needs help, we should be ready to assist. If we see a need for a small group, perhaps we should host one. Or if the Sunday school rooms need to be cleaned, perhaps we should clean the rooms. Whatever the need that arises, there's nothing too trivial that the Spirit can't lead us to do that. And so it says here that they laid their hands on them. You know, there's nothing special about the laying on of hands. If you're a deacon in the Baptist church, you went through an ordination ceremony where people laid hands on you in, in the, in the, uh, from the congregation uh, in order to designate that you were set apart to do a special job. It, there's no special power. Uh, it just sets this group aside for special service. In this case, they were serving the widows. Uh, in, in our churches today, deacons do different things. Sometimes it's visitation. Sometimes it's assisting with, uh, with Bible study or it's assisting with, with even Bible school. Uh, the God calls deacons to do lots of different things. Now look at verses 8 through 10. Now we focus on Stephen in particular. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue, synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, these men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Uh, the indication here is that, that this opposition that arose couldn't fight his logic. They, 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 they turn uh, away from logic then and we'll see that they'll go to dishonesty. But because the spirit was in Stephen, and because the Holy Spirit was leading him, uh, he was willing to do and able to do many things that were signs and wonders. He validated the early church's message about Jesus Christ, and he became widely known. And so what did these people who were in opposition do to him? Look at chapter 6, verses 11 through 15. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Does this playbook sound similar? 
to what you've heard about in the past? Does it sound familiar to you as to what happened to Jesus Christ? Notice here that it says secretly persuaded. The Greek word used here is a word that literally means to throw under. And when I saw that, I thought about it immediately throw under the bus. That's a modern term for taking somebody and making them the scapegoat and throw them under the bus. So people are leaving uh, the church going to, the, to become Christians. So we've got to blame somebody. We're going to put that on Stephen. Uh, and it, it emphasizes the idea that, there's, that they're ahead of some kind of a plot or conspiracy. It suggests that Stephen's opponents relied on manipulation rather than to put words in the mouths of those making accusations against him in an effort to frame him, they decided they would bring him to trial. And so they do. And what they do is the same thing that the Sanhedrin did when they brought another person like this before them, Jesus Christ. Notice they followed the script almost exactly for Jesus' trial. Uh, Math, uh, it's in Matthew's account in, in verse 65 of chapter 26, it says, Then the high priest tore his clothes and says, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. That's what they said about Jesus. That's what they're going to say here about Stephen. Blasphemy against Moses and against God, they say. That's what Stephen's done. When Jesus talked about destroying and rebuilding the temple, he was speaking about his own body, specifically the crucifixion and resurrection. Here, they bring in false witnesses to say uh, what Stephen has done. What did they do with Jesus? Look in Matthew 26, 59. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any though many false witnesses came forward. Same script they use. They don't have the truth. They don't know how to deal with this, and so they deal with it falsely. Uh, notice they said Stephen preached that this place can be destroyed. It would be destroyed by the Romans eventually, uh, but, but they, they, they don't understand what Stephen's talking about. They did the same thing with Jesus. Look in, in Matthew 26, 61. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. They thought he was talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his own body. And so this, this misunderstanding and misrepresentation would be uh, something that would infuriate uh, the Sanhedrin. They were, their whole belief system was based on tradition and based on things that had been passed down from all the way from Abraham. Look at this explanation here. It says the Jews greatly revealed, revered Abraham and prided themselves in being his children, but they confused physical descent with spiritual experience and depended on their national heritage rather than their personal faith. The Jews were blind to the simple faith of Abraham and the patriarchs, and they had cluttered it with man-made traditions that made salvation a matter of good works, not faith. God has no grandchildren. Each of us must be born into the family of God through personal faith in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that these Jews in first century Christianity in Jerusalem they didn't have salvation because their father Abraham had it. Faith and, and salvation comes with each individual. And it says he has no grandchildren, no grandchildren in the faith. That's a personal decision that everyone had to make. And I find this statement uh, in, in here that, uh, that, uh, that is made in verse 15, that Stephen appeared to him, them to have the faith of an angel. The face of an angel. Now, now Luke, I don't know if he was present or if he got this from personal testimony, but the people who looked at Stephen, even though they're about to convict him and have him stoned, they realized he was a different character. He had the face of an angel. 
and they have him on trial here. Look at what they have him on trial for and the charges that are against him. The first four verses of chapter 7. Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. I like the way that, uh, that Charles Swindoll uh, describes this. He said, Stephen looked at his circumstances and instead of feeling pressure to save his own life, he saw a once in a lifetime opportunity to testify to these people for a few precious moments. He was given undivided attention to the Jewish Sanhedrin, the most powerful, the most influential men in Jerusalem. And rather than waste those critical moments pleading for his life or refuting the false testimonies that had been given about him, he made his point and he made it well. At this point, he proceeds to trace the history of Israel from Abraham to the moment he's delivering this sermon. And so beginning in verse 5, and I'm not going to put all these verses on the, on the screen, but just summarize them. He begins in verse 5 by talking about Abraham's covenant, the land that's promised to him, the descendants that are promised to Abraham. And he continues and retraces the story of Joseph being sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers and how God preserved Joseph uh, in Egypt. And then he preserved Jacob and his whole family through what Joseph was able to accomplish in, e in Egypt. And then he goes into the enslavement of these descendants of Abraham in Egypt for 400 years. They're enslaved. And he, he, he talks about the arrival of Moses on the scene and how Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh. And because he killed an Egyptian, he had to flee. And he fled to Midian. And there he worked as a shepherd. He took a wife. And in, the, in, in this desert, he came into contact with God in a special way in the burning bush. And an angel appeared to him and called him to, uh, to a holy purpose and to go back to Egypt and bring the people out of Egypt. And Stephen says he led them out of Egypt. He led God's people out of Egypt. And then he, he talks a bit about the history of the Hebrew nation, especially about David's temple taking the place of the tabernacle and it becomes a holy place. And, and David didn't get to build it, but Solomon did. And you have this temple that was built in, in for, for God, for the Most High. But then Stephen says this, but the Most High does not live in houses made by men. He lives in men themselves. Look at verse uh, 51 and 53 through 53 in chapter 7. Here's what he says. The people had made this temple an idol. And he says, you stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels but have not obeyed it. Warren Wiersbe uh, uh, explains this problem. And this is what Wiersbe says. The Jews greatly revered Abraham and prided themselves in being his children, but they confused physical descent with a spiritual experience and depended on their national heritage rather than their personal faith. The Jews were blind to the simple faith of Abraham and the patriarchs, and they had cluttered it with man-made traditions that made salvation a matter of good works and not faith. God has no grandchildren. Each of us must be sworn into the family of God through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Personal faith. That's the important part. He says, you have uncircumcised hearts. 
They, pr they prided themselves in, in circumcision, physical circumcision, but their hearts had not been circumcised. And so when he said this, here's what the reaction of the group was in 54 through 60. When they heard this, they were furious, gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. This is a, uh, an amazing scene. It says they gnashed their teeth. The other translation said they ground their teeth. And you imagine them talking through their teeth like that. They're so angry. Uh, the truth is always difficult for us to admit. And they rushed him. This is mob violence, which left those who were guilty in a state really of anonymity. How are they going to prove who cast the stone, who killed him? And, and here's, here's Stephen dying outside the walls of the city. And he says, do not hold this sin against them. Another parallel to Jesus Christ, who on the cross requested that God not hold this sin against those people who had put him on the cross. And when I think about this story, the, the question that comes to me here at the end of the story of Stephen, do I have the courage that Stephen had? Do I have the courage to stand up for God no matter what the world might be saying? In a world that we live in that seems to be diametrically opposed to Christian lifestyle and Christian faith, am I willing to stand up for Christ no matter the cost? I want you to listen to a story about a hymn that we all know that, that urges us to do that very thing. Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus was written as a tribute by Pastor George Duffield after the tragic death of his friend and fellow pastor, Dudley Ting. In 1858, a citywide revival was spreading throughout Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. One of the most dynamic preachers during this time was the young Episcopalian Dudley Ting, who had followed his father as a pastor of the large church of the Epiphany of Philadelphia. The future seemed promising for this young pastor, but unrest developed among some members because of his fervent doctrinal preaching and bold stand against slavery. Pastor Ting resigned, and he and a group of friends started the Church of the Covenant. While he was serving as pastor, at this newly organized church, he also began leading a noontime service at the downtown YMCA. He felt a great burden on his heart for reaching husbands and fathers for Christ. On March the 30th, 1858, 5,000 men attended the noon service. Brother Ting was overwhelmed to speak before such a crowd. He told them, I must fulfill my master's uh, errand. And I would rather that this right arm were amputated at the trunk than I should come short of my duty to you in delivering God's message. Pastor Ting preached that day on Exodus 10, 11. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. Over 1,000 men responded to the altar call and committed their lives to Christ. Just two weeks later, Dudley Ting was visiting a local farm and watching a corn thrashing machine in, pro, in, in his progress. Tragically, a long sleeve in his, in his shirt got caught in the cogs of the machine and his arm was severely lacerated and an artery was severed. Four days later, his arm was amputated, but the wound became infected and without the benefit of antibiotics available to us today, he died. Ting was unable to recover and as he lay dying, he whispered to his father, stand up for Jesus, father. 
and tell my brethren of the ministry to stand up for Jesus. Dudley Ting was only 33 years old when he died. And his fellow pastor, our fellow pastor in, in, in Philadelphia, wrote this hymn for his memory. It goes like this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall, he, shall lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in, in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail. You, you dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls our danger, be never wanting there. Sing this last stanza with me. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. I hope you're willing to stand up for Jesus this week. I'll see you next Sunday.